Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this Cantel Medical fourth quarter 2020 earnings call. As a reminder, all phone participants are in a listen-only mode, but after today's prepared remarks, you will have the opportunity to ask questions, and instructions on how to do so will be shared at that time. And now, to get us started with opening remarks and introductions, I am pleased to turn the floor to Vice President of FP&A and Investor Relations, Mr. Matt Mikowski. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. On today's call, we have Chuck Diker, Chairman of the Board, George Fatiades, Chief Executive Officer, Peter Clifford, President and Chief Operating Officer, Seth Yellen, Executive Vice President and Chief Growth Officer, Sean Blakeman, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, and Brian Capone, Senior Vice President, Corporate Controller and Chief Accounting Officer. Earlier this morning, the company issued a press release announcing the financial results for the fourth quarter of fiscal year 2020. In addition, we have posted a supplemental presentation to complement today's call. This presentation, along with reconciliations of non-GAAP references, can be found on Cantel's website in the Investor Relations section under Presentations. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this conference call may contain forward-looking statements. All forward-looking statements involve risks and uncertainties, including without limitation, the risk detailed in a company's filings and reports with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Such statements are only predictions and actual results may differ materially from those projected. Additional information concerning forward-looking statements is contained in our supplemental presentation and earnings release. The company will also be making references on today's call to non-GAAP financial measures. Reconciliations of these financial measures to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measurements are provided in today's earnings press release. With that said, I'll now turn the call over to George. Thank you, Matt. I will uh, provide brief overview comments. Sean will cover the financial perspective, and Peter will spend more time on the execution of our key initiatives. Overall, I'm pleased with how we executed in the fourth quarter amidst the impact from COVID. Our strategy in infection prevention and control has never been more relevant. We achieved our goals with respect to management of operating expense. We continued to maintain safety protocols in all facilities and achieved uninterrupted performance. We exceeded on cash management in the quarter, and in early September, we paid down $75 million on our revolver. We worked with customers to drive adoption of new protocols and facilitate a return to normal activities, and we continue to execute on the Hugh Freedy integration and the initiatives related to Cantel 2.0. As we said in our release this morning, procedures in both medical and dental have steadily improved and are at about 80 to 85% of pre-COVID levels, and they are strengthening. Given the critical nature of the elective procedures we support, we expect a full recovery. We're just not certain of the exact timing. Therefore, as we indicated last quarter, we are not providing conventional financial guidance. However, we do want to give clarity on how we will execute on what we can control, operating expenses and profitability. Specifically, we expect to gradually improve our EBITDA margin from the first quarter to the fourth quarter so that we exit the fiscal year at 19 plus percent, which is the same EBITDA margin with which we entered the COVID impact earlier in calendar 2020. We will also continue to execute on cash management and pay down debt as practical. Finally, we will fund and execute several growth projects, which Peter will cover in some detail. Before turning it over to Sean, I want to underscore a key takeaway about our future. While COVID 
has had a near-term impact on procedures and revenue. We are seeing how COVID is elevating the importance and relevance of Cantel's offering to customers, a factor that will be with us for the longer term. In our medical and dental businesses, we provide infection prevention products and solutions, education, training, and on the ground support that are instrumental to providers being able to deliver care in this fast developing new normal. We are gearing up to serve this demand as you will hear more about. So with that, Sean. Thanks, George, and good morning, everyone. I'm going to go through our key financial results with brief commentary. Following that, like last quarter, I'd like to provide additional context to the financial results during COVID. I will begin with the year-over-year -year comparisons, and given the volume impact, I will close with specific references to more relevant sequential comparisons to 3Q20, as well as provide some insight into the first part of 2021. Of course, the standard reported financial details are available in the earnings deck for you to follow along and we can cover any additional questions you may have during the Q&A. Net sales decreased 2.5% year over year in the fourth quarter 20 versus the prior year and negative 2.7% on a constant currency basis. M&A accounted for 15.7% growth, which was offset by an organic decline of negative 18%. This exceeded our Q4 expectations with procedural volumes in both medical and dental recovering faster in June and July. Overall, our life sciences and dialysis segments have remained resilient during the pandemic with life sciences growing 0.7% and dialysis relatively flat as expected. The dental segment grew 59% on a reported basis driven by the acquisition of Hugh Freedy but declined negative 20.6% on an organic basis, primarily due to the negative impact of COVID-related deferrals of routine dental procedures. Finally, the medical segment decreased by negative 24.8% on an organic basis in the quarter, also driven by COVID-related procedural declines. Capital equipment decreased approximately 36%, with recurring revenue declining approximately 22% in the quarter versus the prior year. Sequentially from Q3, recurring revenue in the fourth quarter actually increased approximately 4% as elective procedures returned in June and July. Turning to consolidated margins, our gap gross margins contracted by negative 320 basis points to 43% versus 46.2% in the fourth quarter 2019, while non-GAAP gross margins declined by 340 basis points year over year to 43.7%. If you recall in the third quarter, I discussed that approximately $45 million of our cost of goods sold is fixed. So relative to our pre-COVID margin levels, the Q4 margin degradation from pre-COVID is almost solely attributable to unabsorbed fixed costs, accounting for approximately $9 million of margin. Moving down to op profit, GAAP op profit decreased 51.2% year over year to 7.2 million. On a non-GAAP basis, op profit decreased 31% year over year to 26.5 million. Regarding tax rates, the GAAP effective tax rate for the quarter was a benefit of 65.1% as compared to the prior year at 26.8%. The tax benefit noted in the quarter was driven by our GAAP loss before taxes and additional federal income tax loss carrybacks allowable under the CARES Act. Non-GAAP effective tax rate came in at 29.6% compared to the prior year rate of 25.6%. This increase was impacted by geographic mix and an increase in valuation allowances for certain income tax positions. As a result, GAAP earnings per share decreased 125.5% year-over-year to negative 5 cents, 
while on a non-GAAP basis, earnings per share decreased 62.6% year-over-year to $0.24. Cents. Finally, adjusted EBITDA came in at $37.9 million, down 19.6% year-over-year. I will now move on to key cash flow and balance sheet items. Even with four to five months operating through the pandemic, cash flow has been a source of strength for Cantel. Cash flow from operations for the quarter came in at $44 million, an increase of 138.7% year-over-year, ending the year with $277.9 million in cash. Working capital increased 62% sequentially to $466 million, driven by the increase in the cash on hand. Accounts receivables were relatively flat. Inventory declined approximately 10%, and accounts payable declined approximately 21%, all on a sequential basis. To put that in perspective for the year, we generated $26 million of positive cash flow from accounts receivables, $12 million from inventory management, and $5 million of additional flow from the rest of the balance sheet, by far our best working capital management in the past five years. We are very pleased that we were able to return operating cash flow to levels between 13 and 14% of sales for the year despite the volume challenges during COVID. Capital expense was $7.6 million this quarter, an increase to keep key projects on track in light of our better than expected cash flows and following a quarter where all but essential capital was suspended. In addition, Cantel is back at more historical CapEx spend levels, ending the year at $34 million of total spend versus $95 million in 2019. To conclude the quarterly financials, our gross debt ended the quarter at $1.1 billion, while net debt was $835.5 million. Our net debt to adjusted EBITDA ratio was 4.73 times, which includes 10 months of Hugh Freedy results. As a reminder, our credit facility amendment provides for a leverage ratio suspension period through October 2021 and requires us to maintain a minimum liquidity of $75 million. We are encouraged that our cash flow was positive even through our worst collections months, putting us in the position to maintain a balance sheet with ample cushion while paying down $75 million in outstanding revolver debt following the end of the fourth quarter in September. We are targeting to pay down a total of at least $125 million in fiscal year 2021, including the $75 million paid down earlier this month. Although we feel the environment is still too uncertain to provide specific guidance for the full year, I'd like to provide some color on our approach for the next two quarters regarding revenue. First of all, We expect first quarter 21 revenue to increase sequentially to approximately $250 to $260 million, given that we see external procedures stabilizing in the 80 to 85% range for the entire quarter versus a Q4 that included a May with procedures in the 60% range. We expect the recovery to continue into our second quarter, though not at the same rate as we saw in Q4. However, it's worth remembering that we have four fewer shipping days in our Q2 due to the winter holiday season. So even with sequential day rate improvements, I would not expect a drastically improved total revenue number from Q1 to Q2. Operating expense in Q1 will see a sequential increase from the fourth quarter as we enter our new fiscal year, stabilizing in the 85 to $90 million range. With volumes recovering, we are opting to gradually cut back on employee furloughs and salary reductions in place through August. I estimate that normalization of items such as sales commissions, bonus accruals, and the cessation of salaried furloughs results in approximately a $15 million increase in our operating expense in Q1 relative to Q4. However, we are also taking cost actions driven by removing the equivalent a 125 headcount and structural cost, which is expected to result in approximately $13 million of savings on an annualized basis. In Q1, that equates to a savings of approximately $2 million, and Q2 will ramp up an additional $1 million for $3 million in savings relative to Q4 2020. 
We believe these cost actions set us up well to react to volume changes as we progress through the year and to improve sequentially each quarter. In the first quarter, with the net cost increase described above, we expect that our EBITDA in Q1 will stay approximately flat from Q4, but will decline as a percentage of revenue. But we are committed to executing a return to a quality of earnings that more closely mirrors our pre-pandemic performance. As George mentioned, we are targeting to navigate the path to 19% EBITDA in Q4 2021 with a sequential recovery of volume in each quarter, but not requiring a return to 100% pre-COVID volumes. I appreciate your patience listening through these additional details, and as a reminder, we will be filing our 10K by next week. I will now hand it over to Peter to provide a few operational updates. Thanks, Sean, and good morning, everyone. I wanted to first provide additional insight on our macro observations of activities on the ground and then focus on actions we have taken for both the short and long term to execute on our strategy. As we are all aware, the impact of COVID on elective procedures through the spring and summer was significant. Using third-party claims data, customer insights through our commercial teams, as well as various industry and other external surveys we have been aggregating data points to provide us a perspective on the overall U.S. markets. From the pre-COVID impacted levels seen in our fiscal second quarter, we estimate that elective GI endoscopy procedures in the U.S. fell to a low in mid-April of just 27% of the Q2 baseline volumes. Since that time, volumes have steadily improved and we are seeing volumes at 80 to 85% of that second quarter pre-COVID baseline in the U.S. medical and dental market. By our estimates, for the procedures relevant to our end markets, we believe that hospitals are operating at over 90% of pre-COVID levels, ASCs are close to 85% of pre-COVID levels, and dental practices are around 80 to 85% of the baseline. The month of August shows strengthening in these trends. Internationally, it has been more challenging to find good data sources, and it varies by country and region. Areas like Germany and the Netherlands, where the virus is well controlled, seem to be nearly back to normal levels, while countries like the UK continue to be at the 80 to 85 percent range. Without question, COVID has elevated infection prevention and control to the forefront of priorities for healthcare providers and dental practitioners. And we are encouraged that this heightened focus on IPNC will continue over the long term. We are seeing shifts in the underlying market with regard to better compliance to existing protocols, as well as the adoption of enhanced infection prevention protocols at all provider types. A few examples, dental professionals are switching from the use of one or perhaps two face masks per day to switching out face masks with each patient encounter which is the existing recommended protocol. Rapid conversion of single-use nasal masks for our nitrix oxide delivery systems from reusable nasal masks. Use of face shields in aerosol producing dental procedures. Shifting to single-use tube sets switched out per patient from tube sets changed daily, as well as a stronger rationale for the use of single-use valves and single-use products in general. The return of patient volumes coupled with the drive for better compliance with IPNC protocols should benefit Cantel over the long term. With the increased and sustained demand for face masks and PPE, we have meaningfully invested in expanding our production capacity. For the last six months, we have been running at maximum capacity 24-7 on all eight of our mass machines bringing our total mass production level to just over 16 million mass per month. In the fourth quarter, we placed orders for an additional eight face mass machines to double our capacity. We anticipate bringing on the first two machines by the end of the first quarter and another two machines online by the end of the second quarter with the remaining four machines in the back half of fiscal 21. Six of these machines will be located in North America, while two will be in our Italy production site supporting regional demand. Despite the continued impact of COVID, we remain focused on executing on our key priorities in support 
of our Cantel 2.0 initiatives. Key among those priorities has been the reconfiguration of the U.S. sales and commercial organization to support the Cantel 2.0 initiatives focused on ASEs as well as enhanced focus on our hospital complete circle protection strategy. Within the ASC space, we have created for the first time a dedicated ASC sales and marketing team. We are deepening our relationship with ASCs as well as hospital-owned outpatient facilities. To be clear, we have a strong leading share of the AER market within the ASC space, but the opportunity for us to broaden the penetration of our full portfolio within the ASC market. We see great opportunity to drive this penetration by an enhanced focus on the overall value and efficiency that our full portfolio brings to the ASC setting, in addition to the improved IPNC benefits. Uh, in the acute care setting, we are seeing early success with our investment in key account directors and the expansion of our infection prevention clinicians in demonstrating the overall value of our CCOP solution. We continue to invest in these CADs and IP clinicians to further enhance our engagement with the large healthcare systems and influence their overall reprocessing workflow protocols, which has resulted in broader adoption of our product solutions. We have transitioned our hospital sales organization to full bag sales reps from product specialists previously focused on solely capital or consumables. With this transition, we have enabled our commercial team to focus on the broad solution of our CCOP offering while still selling to product users and key department heads. In addition, we are experimenting with inside sales to assist the field reps in a model that we have had notable success with in the UK. This builds a capability that ensures we have strong commercial presence even when access may be limited. This has been a reconfiguration rather than a restructuring, allowing us to get better focus and broader capability, yet overall this is cost neutral to the P&L. Looking to Europe, we have made good progress on both the footprint consolidation as well as our commercial efforts. We are on track with our site consolidation with the successful move of all AER production from the BHT operation in Germany to our Pomenzia, Italy facility on August 1st. This was an important project to simplify our Germany business as well as continue to expand our manufacturing center of excellence in Italy. In the fourth quarter, we closed our Dusseldorf sales office, moving all German activity to our existing Augsburg location. As we continue to streamline our processes to improve profit and accelerate growth. In parallel, we have continued to execute on our commercial excellence training and deployment across Europe at an accelerated pace. And we expect this to translate into strong second half 21 commercial performance in EMEA. Finally, we continue to make excellent progress on the integration of Hugh Freedy into our dental business. As mentioned earlier, the value proposition of infection prevention in the dentist office is unprecedented and the addition of Hugh Freedy enhances this unique offering. There is more to come over the next few months, but in short, a new scaler, increased instrument management system setups, Greenlight 2.0 launch, and an overall enhanced focus on education add to our confidence on the future for this business. Despite the impact of COVID on our end markets, we have continued to focus and execute on our key strategic priorities while carefully managing our expenses and key resources. I wanna take this time to thank our global teams for their daily efforts to produce essential products and deliver critical services to our customers and stakeholders during these extraordinary times. With that, we are now ready for questions. Gentlemen, thank you for your remarks. And to our phone audience joining today, we will now segue to our interactive Q&A session. If you would like to ask a live question over your telephone line, simply press star and one on your telephone keypad. Pressing star and one will place your line into a queue and we will take your questions one at a time. Also a friendly reminder that if you're joining this morning on a speaker phone, please return to your handset prior to pressing star and one to be certain that your signal does reach our equipment. 
Once again, ladies and gentlemen, that is star and one. If you would like to ask a question, we'll hear first from Larry Kirsch at Raymond James. Uh, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, I guess uh, just a couple questions, and 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 maybe uh, the easiest one first. Um, so, just with the the new mass manufacturing, you're, you're obviously doubling your capacity. What what does that incremental capacity represent in a dollar amount? Just trying to think about, um, you know, once you're up uh, up at full speed, how we should be thinking about it. And and does it also imply that that with all those machines on, you should be at full capacity by the end of this fiscal year? Yeah, Larry, um, to give some color on, on capacity here, um, look, it's going to probably take us uh, a month or two with each deployment wave of the machines coming in to calibrate and get those up to full capacity. So I would think by the end of fiscal 21, we should have at least uh, six of the eight machines probably up and running at full capacity. Um, from a monetized perspective, look, I, I think the way we're looking at the revenue opportunity is look, this capacity obviously gives us uh, an ability to be very opportunistic uh, in markets uh, right now that are looking for high quality manufactured PPE. And it also gives us an opportunity to uh, use mass as a, an effective uh, bundling uh, anchor uh, in the portfolio on the dental side of the business. So um, uh, we feel very well positioned uh, to again, grow that business pretty aggressively, whether we can cover uh, eight machines 24-7 is, uh, is something that we've got to determine as we get deeper into the year. So uh, maybe just on, thank you for that, Peter, and maybe just on that, just in case I missed it. So if if you had all those machines running, you know, full capacity, wh what would the incremental revenues be, be coming off of that? You know, I, I would say the size of the prize, if we could get to full capacity, is probably three or four million dollars a quarter. Okay, perfect. Um, then secondly, um, I'm just trying to think through uh, through dental. Um, and if I have my numbers right, I think it got worse both on a dollar uh, and percentage basis in the 4Q versus the, the 3Q. So just trying to understand, obviously, you know, you didn't have um, – uh, April in in your 4Q, so and and things start to recover as you start to talk about. So again, I'm just trying to understand w what what else may be going on there that that resulted in that. Uh, yeah, I think that you know the it's like all of the you know the the business right that even though April um, you know wasn't in our Q4, you still had overall Q4 being. COVID, you know, volume affected, whereas in Q3, you did have two months that arguably weren't yet, you know, materially affected by COVID. So I really don't think there's any more to it than that, really, from our point of view, that it's just like volumes overall were down more in Q4 than they were in, in Q3, even though the month of April itself was obviously the worst. Okay, um, perfect. And then last one, um, I guess for you, Sean, is... You know, just as as uh, and 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 thank you for for the color. Um, as you think about 21, I recognize that it's 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 challenging to to put any real numbers out there given the dynamics and you know some uncertainty around the fourth quarter, uh, fourth calendar quarter here. Um, but as as I think about the commentary around the EBITDA margin, um, again, just help me understand. You know, kind of. Um, how you're thinking about sequential improvements to to get to that? I, I I think you're saying the fourth quarter itself for the quarter should be 19% or better, and it does look like that's you know um, a little bit below what the street was anticipating. So so kind of any any color that you can provide as to you know what might be different from what the street expectations were. It looks like that was you know kind of over 20% on that fourth quarter EBITDA, um, and what might be different is as as you guys are looking at your plan for the year. Thank you. Well, you know, to just kind of go back to what we talked about in the, on the call, right? It doesn't require that we get back to 100% of volume, so that's not you know within our model or, or thinking and how we get to to 19%. Um, you know, it, it's really, you know, requires something north of, you know, 90% in medical and dental. So, you know, we are anticipating a sequential uh, recovery in volumes, but that it's going to be, you know, a more modest slope, obviously, than we saw in Q4, which, you know, it's not, shouldn't be surprising to anyone going from 80, 85 to 90, 95 is a much slower slope. Um, and then continued progress against our Cantel 2.0, you know, initiatives as well. 
um, you know, that we anticipate will continue to give us an, an advantage, right, even as we deal with procedural volumes being something south of 100% for the near future. Um, you know, and it's combined with that, right, we're, we're committed to, you know, again, going back to, we think we've set our cost base very well right now to, you know, see how volumes go here in the, the first quarter and the second quarter, right, and, and we're committed to, to reacting to any of the conditions that are thrown at, at us, you know, to, to get to that 19%. So, um, you know, right, we were, we were, we were thinking, you know, obviously the things won't be back the way they were in, in April in, in that scenario, um, you know, but certainly we are baking in, you know, uh, an inherent, um, you know, conservatism, if you will, that we're not out of this and, you know, there's potential for other shocks, right, give or take in certain months as we continue to progress through this. So we're baking all, that all in as best we can and, and we think that that's, you know, right where we're going to end up. And yeah, should we be... I was just going to say, I'd just to add to, to what Sean said, Larry, I, I, I wouldn't read too much into the difference between 19 plus percent and 20 percent. I'm, I'm not even sure we put out a number before we spoke today about where we thought we'd end up <clears throat> at the end of the fourth quarter. I, I, I will tell you, you know, look, we're <clears throat> going to be in the business of being on the more conservative side of things we tell people than on the wildly optimistic side because there's no upside in being optimistic and missing uh, – and missing expectations. So I think that's one way to, to look at how Cantel's going to talk about the future, particularly in the current environment. Okay. Uh, thanks for that, George. That was that was really helpful. And last one on this, and then I'll drop. Um, so, Sean, should we be thinking about sort of sequential improvements in, in EBITDA's margin through the year, or is it kind of Flatter in the first half, and then and then you'd get more of a pronounced step up. Um, just any any thoughts as you kind of start the year out here, just so we make sure we're thinking about this correctly. Yeah. So if you think about again, you know, Q4 to Q1, you know, I had said that I think we'll be relatively flat on a dollar basis on a revenue basis. That's obviously going to degrade the margin somewhat. And then given that you know revenue, uh, you know, back with the, the four day shipping, even with the sequential increase in day rates with revenue in probably not being drastically, you know, improved from Q1 to Q2 because of that, I would expect the margin to be also, you know, right, not drastically improved from Q1 to Q2. So you would see the bump up to 19% more in Q3 and Q4. Okay, perfect. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, Larry. Our next question comes from Matthew Michon at, at KeyBank. Please go ahead, Matt. Thank you for taking the questions, guys, and, and, and good morning. Um, with the large swings that you're going to see in, in, in your markets, I'm just, I'm just curious how you're going to be able to track the, your progress on Cantel 2.0 and understand kind of what is working and, and what might not be, um, and kind of what metrics should we be paying close attention to to kind of gauge your performance? Yeah, Matt, this is Peter. Um, look, I, I think we are, uh, you know, uh, on the ASC strategy specifically, Obviously, we're looking at revenue comps. We're looking at new count setups, um, and, and looking at you know audit or process uh, reviews and studies that we're doing with uh, ASCs as, as sort of key indicators to tell us how we're progressing down that path. Um, on the uh, hospital, you know, CCOP play, uh, we've been measuring here for a couple of quarters uh, a, a, an index that basically tells us the product basket. Uh, execution uh, in the uh, hospital network systems. Obviously, you know, we've been looking at revenue by CAD territories versus non-CAD for over a year now. It's obviously uh, moved the needle in terms of our investment as we saw growth categories much higher in uh, CAD-supported territories than in uh, territories where we did not. Um, on the Europe side, um, we are uh, tracking right now, since we are really still in, uh, in the midst of, of still doing some of the deployment of, of COMEX, uh, the, the key indicators there are really by country, by rep, by regional sales manager, how we're progressing in each module of, uh, of commercial excellence from a deployment perspective. Okay. Peter, thank you very much for the detail around that, around that question. Um, and then moving to, to dental, you know, it seems as if the dental offices are going to be running incremental costs, um, um, some of which is, is going to be a tailwind for, for, for you. So I guess what is the trade-off for, for the dental offices? And, and if you look at the overall portfolio, you know, from, from Cantel and P3D, um, is it a net benefit? Is it, is it neutral or is it potentially a headwind? 
I, Matt, this is Jeff. I, I think in the dental suite, um, obviously they're looking for uh, broad solutions to, to enable them to get back to you know a, an efficient practice flow, uh, and and to enable them to get back to the the, the, the pursuit of volume that they're used to. Um, I think on average it probably is too mild for for the, the can tell you free portfolio. Um, I, I think in particular, you know, we're able to provide you know bundles, product bundles. To the uh, to the customers that they're looking for, that includes whether it's PPE, chemistries, other consumable products, in addition to the reprocessing type of uh, uh, elements that 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 we've uh, historically sold, we see substantial incremental demand for those sorts of products. And I think in particular our IMS uh, product offering, which provides both you know the most efficient type of reprocessing system, as well as a more overall efficient uh, uh, workflow. Is 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 well suited to enable uh, dental practices to, to respond well to this to the current environment and get back to a, a higher overall volume in their practices. Um, and then lastly, around free cash flow. First off, congratulations on the on, on the, the sustained level of free cash flow over the last several quarters. That's um, that's been excellent. Um, can you talk about some of the, the the puts and takes around free cash flow um, for 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 this year? Um, and then how are you thinking about next steps and costs of, of the ERP implementation to, to other, other parts of the business? Okay, I'll, I'll start with, uh, with cash flow for 21. Um, you know, just one thing I, I would keep in mind is that, you know, we, we did successfully deleverage the balance sheet, you know, to the tune of almost $50 million here in the latter half of, of 20. So as volumes continue to recover, you know, AR is going to be, you know, a natural outflow in the first half of the year. And I would also expect that we will have to have some modest inventory investment as we right size, uh, you know, to the right mix and react to volumes coming up. So, you know, I would expect that in the first half of this year, you know, while we've been very successful and we're certainly, you know, we're not going to degrade in our execution, there's just naturally going to be, you know, a cash outflow, if you will, as we invest in working capital modestly here in the first half and probably claw back some of that benefit that we saw in, in the latter half. Um, obviously, we have the sequential expenses, right, that are going to come back, as I discussed in Q1, that will also, uh, if you think about launching off of Q4, that are also going to mitigate what we saw in Q4, um, you know, as well as some continued restructuring costs and, and payouts and things that, um, you know, we'll have. So, um, you know, th there could be some mitigation, although I think most of that will happen in, in more in the latter half of the year, where we'll start getting some of the benefit of our tax clawbacks as we get those returns filed and get the cash from those. So you know, I think our, our cash position in terms of total cash is going to stay pretty stable through Q1, and then you'll see that operating cash ramp back up through the year to get back to that 40 million plus type numbers as we get to the latter half of the second half of 21. And then just to add some color, Matt, on ERP, uh, quietly here during COVID, we've been working very hard of note that uh, we expect the uh, legacy dental business to be brought up on the SAP platform of Hugh Freedy uh, early in the spring. Uh, and we've done that pretty cost effectively, uh, as you haven't seen that spike up in CapEx, obviously, uh, in the results. And uh, I think we will use the remainder of uh, 21 to make sure we've laid out uh, an appropriate plan for EMEA, but I think EMEA uh, Medical will be the next platform that we move yeah. to SAP, and that'll be a fiscal year 22 action. Yeah. I mean, you, you could expect that you know, CapEx is not going to go off the rails more than like eight to $10 million a quarter type run rate on, on average, so for 21. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Our next question will come from Mitra Ramgopal at Sidoti. Yes, hi, uh, good morning. Um, I was just first wondering as we look out at uh, this next year, how we should think about uh, restructuring and acquisition related uh, cost, et cetera, that's largely behind us. Yeah, I, I mean, other, other than, you know, you'll, you'll see some some Q1, uh, you know, restructuring costs probably come through or throughout the year, you'll see some restructuring costs come come through. Um, but, uh, you know, I think most of the large acquisition costs, to your point, that's that's behind us. I mean, again, you'll still see some footprint, you know, type, uh, you know, restructuring costs come through as we continue with some of those actions in Europe and, and dental. But, yeah, the bulk of the Hugh Free acquisition costs um, to the extent that those are now just going to be embedded in, in ongoing amortization depreciation, those are behind us. Okay, thanks. Um, and obviously, you know, you've had two quarters now where COVID has obviously um, affected the operations. And I'm just curious, as you look to implement the 2.0 initiative, um, how has it really uh, changed your outlook as it relates to um, accelerating or 
product introductions um, or even rationalizing the global AER portfolio and maybe any new opportunities, et cetera, you've seen as a result of that. And obviously you've highlighted, for example, face masks so is obviously a plus, but any other um, comments around that would be great. Yeah, Mitra, I, I think the biggest thing that we've learned uh, across the business is just changing the cadence, right? That you can fall into a, 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 a cadence that's running your business on a, a weekly or monthly and quarterly basis. And I think the best opportunity for us that we've seen uh, collectively from an execution standpoint is getting back to running the business on a daily basis. Um, you know, as far as, uh, as um, you know, things that we had started to lay out pre-COVID, I, I think actually the opportunity for us was some of those activities required uh, uh, extra <laughs> pairs of hands to get work done. And I think the excess capacity that was created uh, with the downtime uh, in certain parts of the business allowed us to move smart people to those can't tell 2.0 initiatives to move faster uh, at a quality pace. Okay, no, that's great. Um, and again, just on the M&A front, I've heard mixed things from different companies. Obviously, it's difficult to get some deals done in this kind of environment. At the same token, you are seeing some opportunities as a result of um, pressures and a number of uh, maybe potential competitors, et cetera, are facing. I was just curious, we've covered up to about a year now for a few feet, and I know the focus is to also deliver the balance sheet uh, somewhat. Um, just any thoughts around maybe um, – being active again on the M&A front? Um, yeah, look, I think for the time being, we're very focused on uh, these Cantel 2.0 opportunities, which are significant. And as Peter said, um, you, you know, we've been using this time wisely uh, to push those ahead. So we have obviously work still ahead of us to focus on that. And I think that's where we can get you know, the greatest deployment of our, at least our people resource uh, is there. Secondly, look, we uh, obviously COVID, if it's had some impact, it's certainly been on how quickly we could pay down debt. You, you all know we had the, we took out the issuance on the convertible debt. And the good news is our cash management has improved meaningfully. So we will, uh, we'll, we'll be paying down debt as we go through the year, but that's going to continue to be our primary focus is, uh, is to get that down before we start looking uh, more assertively to things on the outside. We obviously stay active and we look and we continue to follow things because, as you know, uh, the way we do uh, acquisitions in the past are, are usually of a proprietary nature, and those are based on building, you know, relationships with companies that ultimately want to become part of Cantel. So that part we continue to do. But in terms of actually pu pulling the trigger on anything, that's – That'll be a, a, a few months off as we work on getting our capital structure where we want it to be. Okay, uh, no, that's great. Thanks. And then finally, again, just to be clear, um, George, I know you talked about the EBITDA margin, et cetera, uh, by year end should be um, improving off of what we saw this past year. But um, just um, interested in some of the assumptions on that in terms of, as I think you've mentioned, as the business picks up, you'll obviously be bringing people back and there obviously are going to be some cost savings um, that will be more of a permanent nature, et cetera. But um, in terms of just some of the um, costs that were um, sort of you didn't have to incur with travel and other non-essential capex, et cetera, um, how much of that really um, should we see as going away on a more permanent nature? Uh, Sean, I'll let you an I'll let you answer that question. I guess look, what, what as we sort of said at a high level, what we can control are these operating expenses. And if there's one thing that's transpired over the last six months to eight months is the discipline that we have developed and put in place uh, to uh, to manage these things in a very precise way. Certainly been helped by how SAP's functionality has improved. Uh, but we really have put together, I think, a pretty robust playbook. So this operating expense number, uh, look, it, it's not a precise science because you have to put things in place in order to satisfy the, the improvement in volumes. But at the same time, we know the levers we can continue to control to hold off on OPEX until we really understand where revenue is going. But, uh, Sean, if you want to add a little more color, please go ahead. 
Yeah, I mean, that, that is the key. Is that we have the playbook, right, to react as, as necessary. And, you know, we're, we're landing at that, you know, 85 to 90 million, you know, in the first half here, um, because that's, you know, right, what we're targeting to get to that 19% based on our, our anticipation, the recovery, which again, medical and dental being north of 90% in the latter half of the year is kind of how we view the world and how we get to, to 19 um, you know, percent. So, um, you know, to your point, right, uh, Q4 obviously as a base includes very, very, very strict uh, expense control on, on any type of expense around travel and other discretionary expense. And so, you know, we do show that coming back very, very slowly with tight controls on it and, and we'll, we'll continue to react as necessary, you know, given volumes, but, you know, but, you know, the raw numbers, again, to reiterate are, you know, roughly you have $15 million of headwind sequentially from Q4 coming back. And then on a, on a full quarter basis, um, you should get, you know, just a little over $3 million of benefit back off of that from the round of restructuring that we just took. Okay. Thanks again for taking the questions. Gentlemen, our next question will come from the line of Mike Matson at Needham & Company. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so just had a few questions on the Cantel 2.0 program. So um, you mentioned in the slides and I think on the call that you've um, taken the, um, you've created kind of a Salesforce within medical, the U.S. business that create, sells the capital and procedural items. I, I think in the past, um, did you have a separate Salesforce for each of those categories, and you know, is there any risk of any disruption from having um, you know a, a Salesforce now selling you know both, maybe some things that they're not as familiar with, and then can you comment on the the size of the ASD team? I know you're probably not going to give a num any numbers, but you know, maybe just relative to the, uh, the hospital team, how big is that currently? Yeah, Mike, this is Peter. Uh, in, in terms of, uh, I, again, I'm not going to give you a size, I'll just tell you the, you know, the, the focus for the ASC uh, and that dedicated team, full bag reps, uh, we've targeted the largest eight metro ASC regions in the U.S., and that's where we're starting, and uh, with an ambition to hopefully eventually cover the top ten metro ASC regions. So again, in the past, the strategy was um, really what we called our pod structure uh, concept was uh, a, a single capital rep with large territory, sharing that territory with multiple account reps. Um, you know, obviously benefits of, of expertise of, of the product knowledge, but uh, it left us uh, an opportunity uh, to further sell the full bag or the solution sales. So uh, that is the key change on the hospital side. Um, is, uh, is, you know, we have migrated to full bag reps dedicated solely to the hospital uh, partnering with the CADs and the clinicians to drive that CCO piece uh, sale uh, to achieve better uh, pocket share uh, in the hospital customers that we have uh, really strong relationships with today. So on a uh, total headcount basis of feet on the street, it's relatively flat. It, it might be modestly up a couple of heads, uh, but the mix is different. And uh, in terms of uh, risk, uh, you know, we were pretty proactive here in the late third quarter and the fourth quarter anticipating that the structure was going to change and uh, we were executing many training sessions with our sales teams uh, in the U.S. to get people far more familiar with the full bag. So that training had already started before the reconfiguration in June and obviously it continues here in, uh, in July and August and September. Uh, in terms of talent, look, we kept our best reps. Uh, that's one of the key takeaways from uh, the reconfiguration in June is uh, in the entire year of fiscal 20, we probably saw about 20% of our reps turnover. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, we, we feel very strongly that we had the best team in the industry from a sales perspective and we kept the lion's share bulk of that team uh, and, and really spent the time required to retrain people uh, to be successful here in 21. Okay, thanks. And then I know you had talked about, you know, prior to COVID, trying to improve the, the new product cadence. So I think there were at least two two things that you had launched in medical. One was, I think, a cleaning valve, and then you had this new Scope Buddy Plus. So I, I know that, you know, those investors maybe aren't as focused on new products just given everything that's happened with COVID, but I was just curious if you could comment on any traction you're seeing with those those products and any other 
new product that, that you're willing to talk about in medical or dental for that matter. Thanks. Yeah, in many ways due to COVID, right, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the coming out of this gives us almost a second window to relaunch. Uh, both Scope Buddy Plus and the cleaning adapter came really late in 1Q and the start of 2Q, so in fairness, uh, the results were extremely positive, but uh, most, like most things, uh, the third quarter uh, and fourth quarter were non-traditional, so again, I think it offers us an opportunity in the first half of 21 to be very aggressive uh, in our programs as we push these products out uh, as they hold huge potential over the next two to three years on the medical side. And then uh, the other one that we are really, really excited about is, is Hugh Freedy has uh, just launched a new ergonomic scaler uh, in the last uh, 60 days. And uh, obviously at a time right now uh, where dental practitioners are keenly aware uh, and concerned about aerosol uh, in the suite, uh, which is driving uh, a reality of, of folks uh, either eliminating or tr uh, dramatically reducing the amount of power scaling that's happening. So you've got a lot of hygienists that have been used to using manual scaling as a supplement to power that are now going 100% to manual scaling. And, and so again, uh, there's folks that are, are not used to that volume and we think this product is, is going to be a home run uh, coming at the perfect time into the marketplace uh, given, uh, again, the post-COVID world. Okay. okay, thanks. And thank you for your question. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the final question from our audience today. I will turn it back to the Cantel leadership team for any additional or closing remarks. George? Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, you know, it has literally been six months uh, since COVID was declared a pandemic back in the middle of March. Um, we're all very well aware of how this has impacted the world and, you know, individual businesses. What I can tell you today, sitting here on September 17th, is that it, it has been a transformational time for Cantel. As we sit here today, uh, you know, our mission that we've talked about for years um, has never been more relevant, as I said, and we have really geared up to work in our end markets uh, uh, as the leaders in both of these end markets to serve customers. And this is going to, as I said, pay us dividends long term. Secondly, is we've really stepped up our game on how to execute and manage our operations. It was driven by necessity, but now we see it developing into a competency such that even with the kind of uncertainty that still remains on that top line, uh, where we are putting forth that we want to be at the 19 plus percent by, by the fourth quarter, uh, and you know, depending on where revenues go, it could be even better. But again, at least gives uh, our shareholders an understanding of, and having some confidence uh, on our ability to execute. So with that, we look forward to speaking to you on our Q1 results uh, in a few months' time, and thank you for participating in today's call. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's update. We thank you all for your participation. You may now disconnect your lines, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day.